Well, I think my beer mead making was such a success, I thought I'd have a crack at making actual just mead wine. I've got a little bit of that uh, honey residue sugar water there, so I've been flicking through me mead making Viking, no, hang on, making mead like a Viking book, which I quite enjoy. But I'm a little bit slack, because I mean, I am don't know, he's got some really cool ideas in there about lighting a fire and getting some charcoal flavors in there, but we're a bit pressed for time because we're on to another project. So we're just in between, just finished having a bit of lunch and we thought, well, we'll just whip this little video in there for you because everybody was pretty keen to have a, have a beer with me. So now we can have a wine with me. So this recipe calls for a few citrus notes. Now back in my chefing days, I remember you don't want to put the white pith from your lemons and oranges in, in anything because the pith is horrible crap. Makes everything go bitter and muck. So I'm gonna just cut the skins off, put them in. Hey, check this shit out. I bought my wife a new bowl. Now I'm gonna actually put it to use in my own purpose, but still, I'm not as bad as you think. <laughs> I do look after the lovely woman. So he's a good girl. I don't know how she tolerates me, quite honest. I'm just gonna take the skin off these lemons. Now, if you'd bought lemons from the shop, which the Vikings wouldn't have done, by the way, because they didn't have shops. No, well, did they have shops? I don't know. They would have had some way to trade, wouldn't they? Later on in their system, they did, but early on they did. They probably didn't even have lemons back in the day, but that's not the point. These lemons are from a tr my own little tree, so they haven't got any wax and crap on the skin. So if you've gone to the shop and bought a lemon, Remember to wash all the wax and shit off, because otherwise it's not nice beeswax that you would want to have in your in your drink. It'll do some other weird ass uh, shit to you, so just remember that. Wash your wax off. Like a little, little, what's that little kung fu dude? Wax on, wax off. You want your wax off. So I've got a couple of oranges as well. I think I'm gonna put the lemon juice in, but I'm not gonna put the orange juice in, because I figure we're sweet enough. Now, if you're wondering, that orange is actually overripe because it's an old Valencia variety. And when they get past ripe, not past ripe, but anyway, ripe enough, they go green again. So how crazy is that? They sort of go back, go backwards. It's a bit like me, I'm a bit backwards, but anyway. <laughs> Just gonna squeeze this bit of lemon in here. I don't know, I reckon it'd be nice, a bit of lemon juice in there. Bounce it up. There's not as much lemon, not just juice in these old lemons anyway. It's the wrong time of year here. They're sort of the mid, what do you call them? The off, off season lemons almost, but that's all right. I'll have a bit of flavor. Bit of, put a bit of, bit of twang in there. Then we want a bit of um, raisins in. I'm gonna go out and get a bit of rosemary out of the herb garden and throw in here as well, I reckon. Maybe a bit of sage. Mm, sage might go nice, because sage, actually that would be probably better. Sage and honey go together nicely. I wonder if that'd go in the wine though, that'd be weird. Hey, I freaked myself out. I can go and read my bloody book and find out what I'm supposed to put in this crap. <laughs> we'll get the recipe because it says we're supposed to put some raisins in there, but I'm not sure if it was 20 or 12 or, or whatever, but it's more than two, I know that. So anyway, we'll just nip over and grab the book. Ah, yeah, gosh. Reckon me like a Viking. Me making in the Viking age. This is the little, this is the caption. Uh, anyway, this dude's pretty cool. I like it. He's reckon it's approximately back around approximately 400, 10 to 1066, the reason for this threefold thing anyway. Okay, we've got basic mead recipes. That must be where we're up to. This is what I was looking for. Here we go, we got mead for a lazy or impatient Viking. I reckon that's me. I'm pretty lazy and impatient. So it would appear to me that we have to get a couple of tea bags, because this is only, what do we got? A four litre recipe. So we're gonna do 20 litres, because you know, might as well, <laughs> might as well make a decent effort. Sorry, Mr. Book Writer of the Mead thing. I'm not the best with recipes. But I'm enjoying your book though. <laughs> Just don't email me and tell me I fucked this shit up too badly. <laughs> oh, three, four, five. Does it really matter, you reckon? Oh, I don't know. Oh, fucking eight, nine, ten, oh, fucking, I don't know, 20, that'll do. Close enough. God, oh, and one for good luck. Hey, if you were in prison, if you were in prison, you could make, make alcohol just out of a bag.
bag of raisins, can you? Or a bag of sultanas or some crap? I reckon they used to just put them in their socks, in a bucket or some crap. In, in a bucket. Toilet. In the toilet, in a sock in a toilet. Get out of town. It's nah. toilet wine. Toilet wine. Wow. Now, back to my point when I was making the beer. How f***ed up are we humans, honestly? <laughs> I'm not sure. I suppose if I was locked up in jail, I'd make, make some toilet wine. Any ex-criminals out there that happen to be watching our show, don't hesitate to text me and tell me what toilet wine tastes like, because I'm not going to make any. Not happening, but I wouldn't mind hearing from you as to how the toilet wine turned out. <laughs> Well, that might be a bit weird and the edit it's probably going to get edited this bit but anyway i think we're going to want some intense lipton tea bags it says in here oh god the wife loves her green tea but i don't think that's what you're looking for i don't think we want green tea well, i reckon you'd want to put a little bit of water on the tea bags even though they're going to end up in the pot with some water but we're going to have to get hot pot hot water in the pot anyway so we might as well put some hot water on the tea bags to make them start to release the tannins. Not sure whether the bloody Vikings had tea bags, though, did they? Sure. Come on. Right, we'll just put that in there for a minute. My very unfortunate herb garden. Goodness gracious. I'll tell you what, I've got another bath around there with some herbs in it, but anyway, we'll snip a few sage heads off, I reckon. This looks like nice ones here. Smells pretty. Mm. Ooh, hell. I'll give it a bit of a kick. Where are we going to go? Some of this stuff? Well, I don't know, through here somewhere? I reckon honey and rosemary will go together, all right. Mm -hmm. Throw that in the pot. Get a bit of flavour happening. Throw that in there for now. I reckon we're going to bring the tea bags in that. We've got the raisins. We've got the peel. We've got honey out in the other room. So we're going... I think it'll be easy. We'll tip that shit in that room and then we'll take it down the cellar so it can do its thing. I'm not sure what sequence this is playing in. But if we're lucky, you've actually seen us do the wax through the hessian sack and in the saucepan and we melted it in the saucepan. And this stuff here is, I guess you'd call it the wash because it's the, it's the basically the honey that was in that honeycomb that didn't run out and it was very quite sweet. And I thought, well, this might be perfect. This is almost what they, um, you know, what our Norwegian brothers would have used. Oh, it smells like a bit of dangerous crap in here. Got that off. Talking now, that's got that's got some that's, This is gonna be good. Tip out a little bit of extras in. See if we can't get a bit of extra flavour happening. Now I think the raisins are meant to help feed the yeast. I think that's what the go is. Right, here we go. Let's take this down through the place where it all happens. Arr. Arr. I don't know whether these stairs would be our right chance, but they good gracious. They're gonna probably be just perfect, I think, maybe three. Just keep an eye on the side. At least we'll have this documented, so if this actually turns out any good, I'll know how much of whatever I put in there. Because most times I make a lovely meal for dinner and the dear wife says, oh, that was beautiful, I want that again. And I go, well, I wish I could remember what I actually did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I doubt very much that I'm going to get a job with a, as a brewer. Am I? Goodness me. stir and then we'll put the lid on and the little airlock and it shall be tickety boo. Mm -hmm. Almost taste that already, can't you? That's oh, kind of brilliant. I wonder how long it's supposed to, I suppose you just can leave it there until it stops bubbling. That's what I normally do when I'm brewing. Pop our lid on. So obviously I've said that before, this is just your airlock, so the, it's called a sealed fermentation. So you can't get any Wrong yeast in there. We'll let that sit down here for a week or maybe two weeks. I don't know, depends on how that goes on. And then I'm at the moment, hey, the upside of this little project is 
I've got to collect wine bottles to put this jolly wine in, so that's a bit of a shame, isn't it? I have to drink a little bit extra during the week. The process of our mead is getting along. We're making our honey, we're making some nice sweet mead this time. This is um, just gonna decanter it so as it can chill out a little bit before we bottle it next week. So we thought we'd show you that piece of this excitement. <laughs> just wondering if I've got a glass down here to give it a try. I might have to go, oh yeah, I can see one behind the beard here. We gotta give it a track. <sighs> give it a little taste test. <laughs> anyway, we'll just take our plug out. <laughs> She's looking a bit dark. But, and we're just going to stick it into a different tub, but I was just looking at my other tub, I think I'm going to give that a bit of a rinse out. Because I do have another, oh, I know where my other, my other proper brew pot's up in the blooming outside room full of honey waiting to make a kick-ass dry mix of this mead madness. I think we better have a taste of this crap and see what it tastes like. Let's see what we've got in here, shall we? Mmm. It's very nice and sweet. The wife won't like that because she likes her wine a bit dry, so that'll be the next one we make, but I don't mind. I mean, a bit of, don't have to, you know, how you mix bourbon and lemonade. That's why you can just make your own without mixing it with anything. I think that's coming along nicely, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure where the beads, I suppose. Depends on which one you read, whether how mead is now clear it's meant to be, but... Anyway, that's why we're going to decanter it, so it can actually have a little bit of time to chill out in a different pot. And then we'll come back and hopefully it'll be a bit clearer, then I'm assuming when it sits in the bottle, all the stuff will set to the bottom and you'll have a bit clearer drink. But if not, it'll be dark sweet mead wine. <laughs> ah. Ah. I'll change my wine because the thing is you don't want to get too much air in that pot because then it could sour the wine so I think I'm going to rinse a hose off and stick a hose on this and decanter it that way. So, <sighs> it's the wrong pot. I will get my siphon hose and we'll use that. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, you don't want to get too much air in your bottom pot, so you want to just... Okay, Ow. so hopefully it doesn't all end up on the floor, otherwise that'll be set. The reason we're transferring this into this pot is because in here you've got all the sediment and all the stuff and all the crap that's in the bottom of this pot. And so if we take that off and we put it in here, then that will calm down and settle a little bit and some of the more of the crap can sit under the tap. And so when we take the mead off and bottle it, it won't have so much sediment in it. If you were really fancy, you could have yourself a little spinning sieve thing like they do at the wineries, but of course, you know, we're in the bush bee man cellar, let's not get carried away. Right, that's that be done. Turn that off. We don't want all that crap. So we whipped that out of there, we tip that up there. Radio, 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 radio. Oh shit, everywhere we've got a mess. Oh, slap the lid on that one. So they're little wine flies trying to have a feed. Those little wine flies are little buggers. They'll get in there and then they, I don't know what they do, but I reckon they might fart in your wine because it makes it stink and it makes it taste like crap. So this is what we're trying to get out of the pot. So if you have a look in here, these are the bits of extras that we added, a bit of thyme and a bit of lemon and a few bits and pieces of citrus to give it a bit of zip. So we'll get rid of that. We'll go and wash that one out. And then I'll be able to start my other one that I'm doing. And we'll put that up on the thing. Oh God. Put our little air seal back in so they keep the wine flies out. And now the other naughtinesses. Look at them all, little beasties. You know, but it's a can of Mortine. I think the Mortine ran out today down here somewhere. But anyway, I'll give them another spray later. So anyway, that can sit in there. And then we'll keep an eye on it and see what the bubbles are doing. And if it chills out, we'll decanter it and stick it in some bottles. And then apparently you've got to wait six months, but I have a sneaking suspicion some of it might get nibbled on before then. 
But anyway, since this episode ended up running a little bit longer than we'd expected and we're down the cellar and it's knock off time and what the hell, I might as well have a little glass of port. Would you like a glass of port? <laughs> this is very high tech. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! That was good! At least the mead's got some f***ing fizz in it! Uh, actually, <laughs> none of that was actually planned. But the good part about the fact that we've just had that little eruption or explosion or calamity, what a waste, is to explain to the young fella what the hole is in the middle of the cellar floor, you see? The shit drains to the hole, and then hopefully you can mop it up. Oh, bloody hell. At least the wife's not home so I can wash my own socks so I don't smell like beer when I cry into bed. <sighs> Would that be on the epic fail list, I reckon? <laughs> anyway, I'm supposed to wrap this up at the moment. Anyway, here I am, sipping on my port, and I'm just chilling back here, and I'm thinking at the end of a bloody another hard day of filming, you wouldn't believe how blooming intense this is to film this show for you guys. I get quite bloody exhausted afterwards, but it's really cool fun, and I'm having a good time, and thank you guys so much for on your Patreon support, because it means a lot to us, and encourages us to keep going and having a good laugh with you. I hope you're having a good laugh along with us. <laughs> so yeah, here's to you. Get some in ya. So luckily the lad had to come back so he can be here to watch us bottle this crap. The only thing is I've, I've a little concerned. I am, well, yes I am a little concerned as to what colour this shit's meant to be. I don't know because I've never made mead before. I mean the last lot was all right to be this beer stuff. Hopefully we keep the beer on the table this episode. That would be really good. <laughs> that, was, that was a hell of a waste, wasn't it? Like got me jolly leg. Anyway, um, so I don't know. So we're going to bottle this off and then hopefully it doesn't explode because I think it's finished fermenting. So I've got me, got me painted beer bottle. This is actually me beer bottle drying rack. So I've got me hot water. I rinse the, rinse the bottles out and give them a clean. And then I've got this cool rack that I made up so they can drip dry. So they're nice and dry and clean. And I'm pretty sure this was an old window that I just nailed some jelly um, well meshing to make a rack. That idea came because I got a really good mate, a really good mate of mine, and he's a home brewer like mad. And down his old cellar, when he had an old farm, he's moved into town now, but he had this old farm, he had this old cellar. And for his drying rack, he had an old bed. So he had an old wire bed. You probably, if you're young enough, you wouldn't know, but the old beds, they used to have a wire base underneath the mattress. So he chucked the mattress down the fire pit, and he had the beer bottles all on the bed base. And I thought that was pretty bloody groovy, so it could drip dry. I didn't have enough room for a whole bed down here, so I just made up a little one out of this, and it, and it works quite good. Someone out there in mead making land's gonna write in and say, that shit's not meant to be brown. What the hell are you done? <laughs> it's interesting the amount of experts we have in all this sort of stuff. It's kind of groovy. I don't know how many do we need. I don't know. <laughs> oh, God. I was just thinking, now that we've got ourselves organised and got a clothing range, bloke should have got organised and had a Bush B-Man label for his bottles. That'll be the next thing, won't it? But you know what would be the problem with that idea? You'd have to peel the blooming labels off the bottles in the first place. But that might be just way too much effort. I suppose you could stick it over the top, but anyway. I reckon we're gonna find out whether the stuff's any good before we bother about making a wine label. Here we go. Oh, we better take the airlock off. Oh shit, where's the lids? I had a lid, I had the lid somewhere. Where did they go? Oh, hang on, I'll just get the lids, folks. <laughs> cool. I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether I'm getting in the Viking League here. <laughs> but we're having fun. The other night I was watching a movie about the Vikings, or not about the Vikings, the Vikings were kind of in it. And they were actually up in, like it was King Arthur the movie, and I don't know how cool their time frames are. But they had the, they had the jolly, um, basically they were controlling the north of England, the Vikings at that, in that particular time. And I thought that was pretty cool. So here I am, I've got a connection to my English 
relatives. No, I haven't got any English relatives. My wife's English relatives. I got some English friends. Now I've got English customers, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> I've got no idea. I wonder what colour this is meant to be. It's quite dark, isn't it? I reckon we're going to have to, we're going to, have, to have a taste, though. Right, put it like that so you can see it. What do you reckon? Shall we have a taste? I'll try not to do what I did there. I don't have too much. We'll just hold it up to the light. It clings to the glass nicely. It's rather thick and... Oh, it has a sort of... It has a honey taste. Mm, funny that. <laughs> Back in one of our wine labels that we've got here. Give you a big story about how cool it is. <laughs> what does it say here? Says, says, blind bush me man. Can't read that without his glasses. That's what that says. <laughs> well, I'm sure it says, lovely fruity notes. Smells of heather from the hills. Where we're on the left, talking about stupid shit like that. I was at the Epicurean Club. Epicureans? Epicureans. It's a bit like the Beef and Red Wine Club or the Beef and Burgundy Boys. Or Anyway, these guys are a bit more upmarket. So they were Epicureans, whatever that means. Google that crap up and find out what an Epicurean is. But anyway, they could tell you what side of the hill the wine was growing on. Now, how cool was that? I reckon. It'd be interesting to know what part of the box this honey came out of, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be something different? Imagine that at the wine tasting or the mead tasting. Yeah, I think this was collected on the sunny side of the rose bush. Such like floral hints. Like, what the f? <laughs> I mean, honestly, ah, stop it. Anyway, it's all good. At least the, at least the lids are interchangeable. Oh, that'd be a pain, wouldn't it? I wondered about that when I was washing all these bottles and washing the lids. I thought that'd be just dandy, wouldn't it, if they didn't in interact? Shit, I'm you know, buffing off Rep Me Tap. It's a farm hand. I better not get this new jumper dirty before the wife gets home, I'll be in deep shit. <laughs> They'll be like, what the hell? Get on there with your bloody new clothes on. Good God. Whew. Hell, that looks like a party. Oh shit, you guys are still here, aren't you? <laughs> hey, we should wrap this episode up. Well, before I go and rinse me pot out, I thought I might just have a little relaxation here and wrap this up. I was just thinking, um, yeah, it's interesting, the circle of life, isn't it? The other, Oh, well, I don't know. It was a while ago, but not well, not so long ago. Uh, when a, my best friend's father passed away, and I had, went along to the funeral, and that's you know, well, I was no, I don't know. I hope this isn't going to be a downer for our show, but it's interesting because I was we went along, and you know, they have the nice normal talks and the usual stuff that happens at funerals. I mean, they're always slightly different, but at the end of the funeral. They were basically, when they were taking my mate's dad to the hearse, they had this really cool song. I'd never heard this song before. I, it was, um, what was it called? It was, I'm going to say it in their dialect, but it was on Lockley Moor Without Bat, which was basically on Lockley Moor Without Hat. And I had never heard this. And I mean, my um, family, my, my mate's family was from Yorkshire. And I think this is the Yorkshire National Anthem, for what I can gather. And it's really cool, because it's the whole song is about this dude. He's on Lockley Moor with his girlfriend. I'm not sure whether he's up to mischief. Like, because there's a few versions. You should go on, on the internet and check their songs out. It's kind of cool. <laughs> there's a few versions of it. Anyway, he's on Lockley Moor without his hat. And his mates are telling him, you're going you're gonna to die out there without your hat, because that bloody cold. So he goes out there and then he does pass away and dies. And so they bury him on the moor. And it's, so Lockley Moor, we buried you on the, on the moor. And I'm gonna do it, I'm, as I've stated before on this show, I am the worst, world's worst singer. I mean, when I was in Sunday school, the school teacher used to tell me that I had to mime. And then when I sucked at miming, she said you had to go up the top of the blooming balcony and hold the light, hold the blooming words up. That was my job. That's how good a singer I am. So I'm not going to sing it. But the men, mainly the men, well, the ladies would have been too, but the men that were singing on Lockley Moor without their hat or Lockley Moor without that, they were 
were singing it with such gusto, it was awesome. And I'm like going, I was just taken away with it. It was really cool. Anyway, sorry, I digress. He passes away, they bury him on the moor, and then along comes some worms and dig him up, or eat him up. They ate the worms come and ate you. Look, yeah, I think the cow goes, the worms come and ate you on, on, on the night. And then along comes some ducks and ate up the worms, which is fairly logical. And then along comes us and ate up the ducks. So obviously they went out duck shoot and ate the ducks. And then the end of the deal is, so now you're in us. And I thought, what a circle of life. How cool is that? Anyway, I shout out to the Yorkshire folk. I reckon you had that shit down. So I hope my good mate knows that I'm thinking, I'm thinking of him and his dad and his mum and his family and all of that crap that goes on. But yeah, we're all in a circle of life, aren't we? So, food for worms, I guess, is that the saying? 